podcasts on wildgamesproductions.com and detroitradio.com. Between the time when wargamers played with chainmail and the rise of the wizards of the coast, there was an age of gamers. And unto this, Gygax, destined to bear the crown jewel of TSR upon a troubled brow, to show you all how to roll for initiative. Roll for initiative podcast, issue number 92, loud volume to issue number 92. DM Vince sitting alongside DM Matthew. Hello, everyone. The formal DM Matthew. And uh, DM Nick. Hi, everybody. And DM Will. What's up? We're back. Full crew this week. Matt is finally back with us. Yes, after a long sabbatical of just wacky stuff keep coming up and pulling me away from the show. Fortunately, you guys were able to keep on going without me. Yeah, we keep on trucking here. We just keep going and keep going. Like the little bunny. Who's this guy? I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) Kind of grabbed the microphone and came in the studio. Cool. (laughs) (laughs) You look like that guy on the street corner that keeps asking for change. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, so Matt, since you've been gone the longest, tell us what you've been doing. You went to Gen Con. I know that. Yes, I did. Went to Gen Con, had a blast. Um, there was a lot, other than playing some Heroclix games, I did a lot of not gaming at Gen Con, like I usually do, and a lot of uh, socializing and partying with gamer friends that I only get to see at Gen Con. So uh, it was very good times. Um, I did uh, lots of merchandising as well, so I picked up bunches of stuff. Um, picked up a couple Roll Aids box sets for like five bucks each. I picked up Sentinels and I picked up Apocalypse. Those. Um, I picked up like a seven or eight uh, supplements for the Babylon Five RPG for like a buck each from a vendor. Really? Yeah. The basically, cool. if you remember the booth, it was buy one get three free. Oh yeah. They well- got bought by Troll and Toad. So huh. they stopped with the whole gimmick of buy one, get three free. They just went straight. Thursday, it was buy one, buy anything in the booth for five bucks. Wow. And then by Saturday, it was buy anything in the booth for two dollars. And then on Sunday, it was buy anything in the booth for a dollar. <laughs> so, yeah, I picked up a bunch of just random stuff there. I picked up like uh, Gary Gygax, uh, something Cosmos book that Troll Lord Games put out for like two bucks. Huh. I picked up a, a war game, a Red Parachute, well, uh, for like two bucks. So a that's point. why I like that one. Why I always tell people when you go to a con, don't buy anything till Sunday. Right, unless it's like a new release, you must have. Like, I pity anyone that really wanted the uh, new uh, Fancy Flight Netrunner game. It was pretty much sold out before the doors opened, practically, because all the people that got early access bought so many of them. The vendors wow. and the VIGs and whatnot. Um, let's see, what else? I bought some board games from uh, Cool Stuff Think. They usually take a bunch of scratch and dent board games, so you can get some good deals there. Um, then I picked up uh, ABP Baseball with like three seasons from like the seventies for like twenty bucks in the Gen Con auction, but uh, yeah, so I, yeah, it's a I like the Stratomatic games and like all the like baseball sim board games. I'm like a huge just fan of that type of stuff. So pick oh. that up and uh, yeah, just bought lots of stuff. I did stop by the D20 Radio slash Gamer Nation booth and picked up my copy of Edition Wars and got to meet uh, full-on gamer and GMs Chris and Dave, so it was nice meeting up with them. So I haven't got a chance to play Edition Wars yet. So It's fun, I'll tell you that. I played it at ReaperCon, it was a lot of fun. Cool, cool. Yeah, I got my autographed copy of it, so I'm special, I guess. Uh, <laughs> ooh, I know. And I finally <laughs> got my Dragonlance Adventures book signed by Tracy Hickman after trying for several years. I just could never run across him when he's in his booth, which is even funnier because I'm friends with Darren, the guy who runs Tracy Hickman's booth. How's Tracy doing? Uh, he's doing good. He's got his new books coming out, so he was signing those and... He's got, uh, I can't think of the series, but he has a series, he's on like the second book of a series, and he's doing like a small print run first, uh, so people who want like the limited edition, like there's only so many of this, like small press print run, then he's doing like the mass market like a year later. 
It's like a I think film. last time he was on, he was talking about doing a Batman he book. He did do a Batman book, too. He's got a Batman book, too. Um, I haven't actually had a chance to read that. Uh, but, yeah, he had that. And, yeah. Was he, it Pimp in her cookbook? Uh, I don't remember seeing the cookbook. By, uh, book? That was supposed to come out. Yeah. It, 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 her cookbook or something like that. Yeah. You get. Like a gamer's yeah. cookbook? Yeah, yeah the, you can get you can make some Raceland brownies or uh, Kinder cookies. <laughs> Not, I don't know if it was exactly that well, but uh, <laughs> Kinder cookies. <laughs> that sounds gross. That sounds like cow flops. <laughs> oh, I stepped into Kinder cookie. Kinder cookies. <laughs> oh, that's just too funny. Yeah, Raceland Kinder cookies. <laughs> 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 Steel sticks, things like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm really disappointed that that booth got bought out by Troll and Toad or whatever the hell it's called. Yeah, but my favorite booth to visit too. Yeah, you can just find such random stuff there. It was awesome. They had a lot of Weg stuff in there too. I noticed. Uh, you're thinking of a different booth. You're thinking of Shimmera Hobbies. I am. There. Yeah, they also do buy one get three free. They had all the Weg stuff. Oh, it was a different movie. Yeah, okay. Titan Games, I think, is what they used to be called. Yeah. Oh, good. yeah, they, they, they yeah. So, yeah, versions. Shimmer Hobby is still there doing their good stuff. I'm, I kept putting off buying stuff there. I'm like hoping because occasionally they would do just buy something for five bucks. So I kept waiting for that to hit, and it never did. And usually bought, on Sunday. Usually. Yeah, usually on Sunday, but they didn't do it this year at Gen Con. So I was kind of sad because I had my eyes on a the Doctor Doom Marvel Superheroes box set. Because they had, like, two or three copies of it. I'm like, I can buy it for 20 and find, like, uh, three other things. Or I could just get that, since that's really the main thing I wanted from them. Let's try to wait. No, but by Sunday, they didn't reduce their prices, and they were all sold out. So mm. I'm a sad panda on that. But Aww. I know. But other than that, Gen Con was good fun and exhausting i was so just sore from lugging around backpack full of game board games on sunday it was like you need a hireling yeah i, I needed a sherpa i <laughs> i needed a, i really need a sherpa for gen well Con. you didn't go to the town crier and put in your five gold pieces to find yourself a hireling at all no i didn't think of it until too late by then all the hi good hirelings were taken yeah, you'll get that one little five-year-old kid out here, Haley. <laughs> Sorry, the board game box is bigger than you. No. <laughs> uh, well, next year I know when I go there I'm going to have to jail Will, so. <laughs> yeah. We're jail. They, actually, they didn't have the jail and bail. <gasps> really? No, they uh -huh. did not. No jail and bail this year. That was for oh. Chipper, too. Yeah, but uh, they just raised, like, a record-breaking amount for Card Hala this year. I forget what the exact number, but it was, like, a ridiculous amount. And, uh... They had over 40,000 people attend Gen Con this year. Wow. Yeah, which uh, two years ago, they only had 30,000. So they went up 10,000 people in two years. Let's head into this is some sage advice. Sage advice. <laughs> sage advice has been brought to you this week by Gen Con. No, I'm kidding. We have no official <laughs> We can't here. say that. <laughs> no, we can't. That's Regional <laughs> lawyers coming our way. Ah! Shockingly, a couple people did approach me a couple weeks ago about being sponsors of the show. But Really? They, yeah, they did, actually. And they kind of fell through because I was like, all right, sure, we can. Because they wanted us to pimp some of their product. Mm -hmm. And they were going to give it to us, a free copy, each of one of us, for just doing a couple episodes about their product. Mm -hmm. and so, I have no problem doing that. Yeah, yeah that's cool. That's yeah. good conversation. Right, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's just actually kind of standard review process, really. Yes. <laughs> they were yeah, actually sure. all physical copies, not PDFs. And I was like, yeah, sure. And then they just never answered back. I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm glad you brought that up and everything because I should contact some companies like GMT and others if, they, if, they'll, if they'll provide more support material. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, we've actually uh, over at Die Hard Game Fan, they've been pretty good to us and sent us quite a few board games to review. So, oh, yeah. if you want to go ahead and like uh want to sponsor a Roll for Initiative, we'll do it. We're not proud. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm talking I was going to talk with yesterday uh this gentleman about his Kickstarter project about um it was a Viking project, uh, a diceless Viking project, I think it was. Uh, about a game, I, but he had some uh, complications. He couldn't get together with me, but I should be getting to get together with him this week and do an interview with him to put it on the show. Cool. 
Yeah, he wants to, you know, push his product. It looked really cool, so I said, yeah, why not? I mean, I don't mind helping a little guy out. Right, sure. Yeah. Everyone's got to start somewhere. Yep. Anyway, uh, RFIstaff at gmail.com if you'd like to sponsor or write in. Uh, 570-865-4210, the hotline. First email comes from Kevin. And he said, thank you for doing the show, issue 90 for the show of DQ. He's like, thank you for comparing it to AD&D. He's like, he had a lot of fun playing it back in the day. He said, the rules box said in hardback books were when second edition came out, and then it became the uh, soft cover for third. Uh, blah, 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 blah. He, his GM was referred to as the great DM as well, how we refer to him as the Joe DM. And just a few things... Let's see here. Movement was called TMR, Tactical Movement Rate. And you could do things like half moves, attack, and all fractions are rounded down, because I know we were debating that for a while. And armor never lost its protection value as it was hit. Well, that was one of the other things we talked about. Blah. What? Blah. <laughs> for Will, all references regarding fatigue in, in DQ rules were shown as FT. I don't know, maybe you said it wrong. I don't know what he's referencing to. Thanks for running an excellent show. Keep up the good work. Orcs don't have pig faces, and clerics can use edge weapons. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's awesome. They don't <laughs> have pig faces, but they have... Did he say they didn't have pig heads or pig faces? He said orcs don't have pig faces. Oh, but they do have pig heads. <laughs> <laughs> they can be pig-headed, though. Uh, yeah, they could be. Next email comes from John. Just wanted to comment on the quality of the AD&D reprints. My PHP went missing aeons ago, and uh, all I have is a DMG in the Monster Manual, so I put the money down for the Player's Handbook. I've got to say I'm happy with the quality, except for the cover, which you guys mentioned isn't exactly the same. The one difference is the interior is the ad in the back, as one would suspect. I don't remember what the original Player's Handbook ad had been, but apparently this one says uh, how to donate to the Gary Gygax Memorial Fund. And the ad is illustrated and laid out in first edition art style, so it looks like the ad's back in the day from the book, John. I don't know. I don't have the book, so is that true? I have not opened any of mine. They're still wrapped in the plastic shrink. Nick, you have yours. handbook? Yeah, I got the new one here. Go to the very last page, I guess. Sure. Hold on one. Memento, I'm getting it. I'm digging it out of my bag here. I was... Shame on you. You're going to ruin that book. Uh, Well, it's going to be you, so tough... Tough cookies. Kind of uh, cookies. Yes. <laughs> well, Nick looks up the book. Speaking no, of, I got it right here. It says um, they have for the. Uh, it says the legend lives on, and it's about the um, Gygax Memorial Fund. And it's styled like first edition art style. Actually, the artwork is done by Errol Otis. Okay, so cool. it's done in first edition so, style. Then. You got it. Speaking about the books, Will, you people keep asking me, contest, what's going on? Ah, uh, yes, I'm just waiting on an extra set of books to come in and everything just to make sure that I have them all. I, I just want to make sure that I do have my complete collection of books complete. Uh, the project should, I, I should have uh, details here in the coming week or so because i like the project to come to an end before Halloween of this year. All right, so Which is next, next month. So issue number 93, we'll be talking about your contest. There you go. That sounds good to me. Okay. Last email comes in from, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Nedavarius. It's, it's his forum name. Fantastic show, guys. I work overnight to find, and find the show about a week or so ago. Your podcasts have made my last several evenings go by so much faster. For that, you may have my many thanks alone, and I hope to become a regular active member on the forums. Keep it up. Thank you. Know that here in Dallas you have our support. Oh, that's cool. He's right here in cool. Dallas. That's about 40 minutes away from me. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks. As long as it doesn't, doesn't bling, bring that now virus over there around there. <laughs> now virus? The now virus. I hear y'all getting the Nile. Well, the West Nile virus is what he's talking oh, the about. The Nile virus. Okay. Yeah. I don't know about that. Yes. Avoid the mosquitoes. Yeah. Good. We're in north of Dallas, so I'm fine. I just spray a lot. I go, and then I'll go. <laughs> and that concludes the emails. I don't have anything else. Uh, anyone else have anything to say? No. 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 You have any I got nothing. Will, you have any advice for us? No. 
Thanks. All right. <laughs> no, it's all good. Thank you for the emails. RFI staff at gmail.com. Uh, RFI podcast.com is a website with the contact form on there. You can email us. 570-865-4210, the hotline. Overstargaming.org slash forums is where you can reach us at all times. Even Nick. Even me? Yes, even you. Yeah, yeah I've been there a few times already. I'm starting to go there more. Yes, Nick has been arguing in our forums as of late. So Yes, blah, 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 blah. There. <laughs> and argue with Nick. Nick appreciates all the arguments possible. You'll know me. I'm under the uh, name Blackstone. I don't shh, argue that much. Shh, shh, don't tell people you're Blackstone. <gasps> shh, wait, 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 wait. You're Blackstone? <laughs> yeah, I kind of am. Oh, you're uh, done now. I know. Speaking of which, people keep saying, where's the Blackstone's vault? I'm like, he's on the show. Yeah, is- he's on the show now. <laughs> Why is he going to do a segment? He's on the show. Anyway, that's in the table manners. Typical of all the evil creatures in the world. I'd like to find one with table manners. And what are you kidding me? I've spent years cultivating the worst table manners on the planet. Table manners. Okay, on today's Table Manners, we are going to talk about the Undead Legions, which is found in this Roll Aid supplement titled Undead. I read this. Say again? 737. What's that? that that's the uh, uh, Roll Aid's uh, n- product number. <laughs> oh, okay. I said 737. That's not what time it is. It's 224 here. Okay. Oh. Well, I thought you was giving like seven minutes and 37 seconds to, to conduct. Yeah. Anyway. He's yeah, giving time stamps on the show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> for, yes, for giving the time cues. Okay. <laughs> okay. Degrees this outside. Is... <laughs> So uh, the Undead Legions, uh, there was an interesting uh, section here or a a chapter talking about the Undead Legions. And I really like this because uh, I'm a big player of uh, Games Workshop, fantasy especially. And uh, when you play that game, you're dealing with legions of miniatures. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you're looking at the same thing here concerning the Undead Legions, how they are set up and how they fight. And uh, when I was reading this on how 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 they made this army, and that's basically what it is. It's just a, a massive army of undead uh, undead creatures. Uh, the first movie that came to my mind, and I, I think it was Army of Darkness. Troy. Dark- huh? Uh, never Which mind. one? Said, army of Darkness. Oh, no, no, no. I was thinking of Troy. Okay. Did you all see Troy? Which one? The one with, uh, I can't Brad think Pitt. of that act. Brad Pitt. That's the one. Okay, yeah, yes. I did see that, yeah. And, and, you know, uh, I didn't really care for the movie because it was all, I don't know who it was, you know, developed for, made for, but definitely wasn't made for someone like me as a historian. But uh, I think it it shows a prime example of how an undead army or a legion of undead would work. As you saw, uh, what was was that guy's name, the boss, the bad guy? What was his name again? Uh, I can't think of his name, but he was sitting back there and he was the one directing the uh, people to attack. I saw that a long time ago. I don't remember. Well, I mean, basically, if you've seen the movie Troy, this is basically the same concept here when you deal with the undead legions. Now, we're not dealing with, uh, I mean, with with Troy now. Good Lord, I I can't even begin to tell you how many ranks and files there were of uh, soldiers on the bad guy's side that Troy had to fight. But his technique in defeating them is the same technique that is, that is uh, mentioned here in this chapter. I thought that was pretty interesting. So let's talk about the legion of un- this, this legion of undead creatures here. In this particular supplement, they, uh, this army that we're talking about is, is, is primarily uh, composed of skeletons. And the example is that they have the skeletons and they have four ranks of skeletons. Did you all read that part? Yeah. yeah. Okay, now it's pretty interesting because in most movies that you see of this nature, whether uh, whether it's like Troy or whether it's like uh, I'm just I, I just had a thought of another one, but I just can't think of it right now. At the time, time uh, it was a uh, oh my lord, I think it was Braveheart. But anyway, what happens is you're going to have a general. He's going to send out his first rank. Usually your first rank of of soldiers or undead, in this case here, are going to be your weakest ones. Usually conscripts 
or um, you all know what a conscript is, right? Yeah. Okay, usually conscripts. And then you also have like um, hired mercenaries Mm -hmm. or anything of that nature. Yeah, basically they send in the cannon fodder first to weaken the front line, not necessarily punch a hole through it. Then the second waves of better trained, uh, better fighters and uh, soldiers come through and clean up the uh, mess that the uh, first rank uh, weakened. Exactly. And that's the primary purpose of that first rank. Now, that's not the case for all battles. But in this case, if you're, if you're having a battle, uh, uh, just a huge battle with tens of thousands. And I think it's also applied in, in, uh, in uh, the, uh, the Lord of the Rings in the final battle. As How about say, 300? Say again? The movie 300 as well. Up oh, yeah. 300 is another prime example, and that, that's that's very exceptional. Now, you know, since we're talking about history, I do know known that at times where um, uh, I'm trying to think of Napoleon. I know that he had an army set up and where he sent the concert. I can't think of the battle this time period right now. It's just so many things oh. I remember. But that's the primary purpose of that first wreck is to go in there and shake it up a little bit, cause a little bit of confusion. Are they probably going to die? Now, nine times out of ten, they're probably going to die and everything. That's the purpose of that first rank. Now, the second rank, this is where the skeletons get a little more powerful and everything. This is your archers. These are your. This is going to be your your rank where it's going to have all the um, the uh, ranged weapons, which can go from catapults to uh, longbows, short and stuff like that. Now, I found it unusual here that they specifically stated the skeletons would not use crossbows. Can you all figure out why? Oh, it says they've never used crossbows or slings. Can, can you tell me why that is? Or why you think that is? Hmm. I would think... I thought that was odd, too. Maybe the mechanics of the of the weapons, maybe? Uh, it, possibly? Or it's just... Um, I was just thinking the mechanics of the crossbow is probably too difficult for a skeleton to to grasp and actually reload. That's what the only thing oh, I can okay. think of. I would say the reload part. Maybe that would be tough for them to do. Right. Yeah, that makes sense because, like I said, skeletons have a non-intelligence according to the uh, monster manual. Right, and they're not right. the right. most dexterous uh, of creatures either. So <laughs> trying to do uh, fine, detailed work. It's not their strong point, so maybe just loading a crossbow is a little too complex for them. Also, I would right. think of as even with most armies on the battlefield, it takes a while to reload a crossbow. While with your your standard bow, it you know it's just a matter of pulling the arrow out of the quiver, aiming, shoot. Right, and then so it's a matter of time too. I think. right, yeah, because right. You, usually with the crossbow, you would fire it, then you have to basically plant it against the ground, pull it up, load the bolt, and you're at that point, you would have already been slaughtered. <laughs> right. Right. And see, then the point that I said, like, I didn't understand why, and you all have very valid points, I agree, because of their, their, their non-intelligence, I think it'd be too difficult for them to comprehend how to use a crossbow. Or, I mean, a sling, not so much, but it did state that, uh, that they have been known to use siege engines. And siege engines ain't just simply just, you know, put a rock in there, you know, uh, roll the thing back, you know, let loose the rope, pull it back down again, put the rock in and so on. So it was just a little confusing. They, they can't use crossbows, but they can use siege engines, ballistae or whatever the case may be, whatever they want to use. In a case like this, this is what I, I really would like, instead of them throwing rocks, that they would throw like bloated corpses of like dead cows or dead animals, or even dead bodies that are full mm-hmm. of disease or whatever. Or perhaps then, the sacks of the creature we will be talking about in the Creature Feature Theater. Exactly. Prime example. I'm not going to say anything about that. But so, again, these are things that are just ideas for that, that second rank. Now, your third rank is where the spearmen come in. Now, these are going to be your much more, uh, your veteran skeletons. Now, see, this is interesting how they develop these skeletons from being a, 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 a low-life skeleton, a useless skeleton, to someone that's almost as good. But now we're talking about veteran fighters. So it makes me wonder if there's, like, different types of skeletons. Like, for example, you have your regular common skeleton, or you have your animal skeletons, then your common skeleton. But now, are we talking about skeletal warriors? Are we talking about just a, a 
different type of skeleton that's just a lot more stronger. It might have a low intelligence where it has the ability to think a little bit on its own. I don't know. Anyway, but the third rank skeletons are interesting because these are the ones that can usually be your spearmen. These are the ones that's going to break the enemy ranks if they can right. push forward, you know, hard enough and strong enough. This is the one that's going to put, especially if they're doing a frontal assault. This is the one that's going to break the middle. So break. these are your, 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 like your pikemen, your polearm guys. Yes, exactly. And it wouldn't shock me now. So now, now this is what they're used for. Now, my question is, since the skeletons in the second rank can't use crossbows, can these skeletons, not being their veteran, they might have some intelligence. Can we use this skeleton, the third rank, to brace against a cavalry attack? That's or, how I would think they would, could be used out of as well. Right. There you go. It would make sense to me. Yeah, especially if a cavalry was sweeping along the flank. You would right. Yeah, the third rank you could easily should be able to easily fight off of the incoming right. cavalry. And like I said, it all depends on whether the army is offensive or defensive, and that that's the big key thing in how these skeletons are going to be used. I mean, like I said, you know, if I was cavalry and I saw a whole line of a legion of skeletons holding those spears up, I'm thinking like, uh, do you want to charge it? Now nah, let's get the pal and then turn them. Yeah, you know what? It even <laughs> says in the third rank that their intelligence for the third rank skeletons is anywhere from non to low intelligence. Right. So right. they would at least have some rudimentary intelligence to use to at least, you know, have some sort of uh, idea, some tactics to use. Maybe. Right. right. Yeah, just they have some more organization, yeah. I guess. That you might right. They would be able to adapt from pushing straight ahead to turning to their side to fight the flank. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And then last but not least, we'll talk about the fourth rank. And this is where they consider it the elite uh, fighting force of this legion of, of, of skeletons or this army of skeletons and everything. And now uh, these are very interesting here. These could be a number of things. Now, the examples they give in here is that, you know, they wear, they wear heavier armor. Uh, they're much more well-equipped. Uh, they're going to be placed uh, strategically with other units to break through other ranks of the enemy uh, forces and, uh, and stuff like that. So it's pretty interesting with these because – now, this is funny how they use this, this statement here. It's called a spreet de corps, which is a, a common thing for us Marines or former Marines or those that are in the Marine Corps. They know what a spreet de corps is. These are the ones that provide motivation. These are the undead that, that will – you know, I can't see undead losing morale. This is this right. is where it comes in again. These undead might have some type of morale ability. I don't know. It doesn't state it specifically. But with a spree to core, these are the ones that's going to get these forces up on their feet and say, charge no matter what. And they're not even going to think twice about it. So maybe morale is not an issue. But there must be some other mechanic in there that allows these uh, this this last rank to motivate the other ranks before them or whatever other units they encounter on their side to be motivated to give them a, a you know an oomph into their attack. I so, think these fourth rank guys, it sounds like these are the guys who are actually barking the commands out for what the other three ranks to do. Well, they, they do they have just the, follow. Uh, well, there's well, actually a commander per hundred skeletons. Commanders. Yeah, so, there is yeah, a commander yeah, for but, each of the ranks now. But the this fourth what, rank can speak, however, at least 75% of them. That's right. And that's the key thing right there. And see, that's that, that's the thing about they have some type of ability or some ma means of motivating others around them. And that's what I like about that fourth rank. They're, this is your this is the ones that really cause some damage. These are the ones you really got to watch out for. These are probably the ones that also go behind or behind the other three and clean up whatever's left. Yeah. Any resistance. And that's what I like about them. And since uh, uh, Matt brought up the commanders, now the commanders is kind of weird. I'm not really impressed with, with some of the commanders. For example, their, their commanders in here are white. Now, before I go into the commanders, I did notice some parts here where we talk about skeletons. There's no reason why, you know, that you can't have some other undead in there like ghouls to complement the skeletons. Just a mishmash of the lower or zombies, 
Oh, and zombies too. Now, the problem with zombies, though, is their speed. This is where we're going to have a problem with zombies. Zombies will be used for a whole different purpose. Now, those would be my first rank is zombies. Yeah. Just have thousands of zombies to slowly Z- march up. Zombies there. would be the two yes. front lines on the side of the uh, triangle. So basically, yes. their whole thing is just stop us from being flanked. Yeah. yeah. So just being the mass of human of humanity that just slows any like uh, flanking cavalry. Oh yeah, you're looking at the tactical setup. Yes. See, I, see, I, now, as a as a former marine, I have some issues with this tactical setup and everything. Uh, yeah, I, it's I, not right. the most tactical of setups, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> no, it really isn't, and this is why I wouldn't put zombies on the side because they're too slow to react. Your zombies, you want to put in the front since they're the slowest of the units. You want them to go up and try and and and, and you know mess around with that front flank of the enemy line. While the faster units, now, see, we ain't talking about, like, skeletons on cavalry or any of that stuff where they can go around and, you know, uh, flank them or whatever the case may be, uh, doing these wedges and, and all this other stuff. It, it, it just all depends. But the commanders is what's interesting. You have whites, wraiths, and specters. And I'm looking at this and say, whoa, now, the specters and whites, those could be really nasty because, you know, we're, we know they're level drainers. Mm-hmm. Yep. But uh, whites, well, I'm sorry, whites are level drainers too. They drain one level. Now, if you go by first edition, these are all level drainers. Spectres drain two, race drain one, whites drain one level. So these commanders, I mean, I, I think they're interesting, but honestly, the, my commander would be a ghost or perhaps a vampire. I can see a vampire, yeah. I can yeah. see a vampire command. Only problem with a vampire there is, though, if the, if the battle's in daylight, Unless that bad boy's got some special cream, he's inside a coffin somewhere. Huh. Yeah. How about a lich? Maybe a lich? A what? A lich. A lich? Uh, a lich? Uh, well, uh, a lich is extremely powerful. I, I, I mean, he could. I don't, How about a I, mummy? I don't. Oh, now, see, a mummy would be interesting. This is why I like Tomb Kings from the Games Workshop Fantasy Line, the Tomb King Army, because I like mummies. A mummy would be exceptional because they're highly intelligent and they are powerful. The lich, I would think, would be more like the leader of the land. And he's the one, you know. Right. And I guess that's like that one guy. In he'd t- be like your, the lich would be like your field marshal in a way. Uh, he'd be more like, I would see the lich as more like the king sending out his army as right. opposed to actually even being on the battlefield. I'll settle it for you. I damn my lich. How about that? Well, what, a bunch of sand in a box with a skull on it? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you mess with him, he can come just suck some souls out, but he only can suck like in 6 to 12 or however many things. He's useless then. No, I, I think the uh, the lich would be great, but uh, just like in Troy, that was actually the leader of that country, of that, of that city. I can't think of who it was for the life of me. I just can't think of his name. That Ooh. was there directing the attacks. But when he realized that his army was getting outflanked and overran, you saw he took off and told the rest to cover his retreat. And eventually, you know, they caught him and killed him later on in the movie. Uh, but uh, again, it, it just all depends here. It's just very interesting here on on the undead. Now, let me tell you why I like undead, and it states it very plain and clear. I don't know if you all caught it, was the fact that undead as an army are very terrifying to those to the living because what happens is if a living foe gets killed by an undead creature depending on what kind it is and depending on what kind of rules you want to implement if there's any type of special magic being 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 done that uh, those creatures slain by the undead rise as undead themselves within a right, certain yeah. time right so and you- add to the ranks of those that are attacking the living i thought that was extraordinary i like that yeah and I believe – I'm sorry. Go ahead. Not only is that terrifying, but I think you're probably going to say oh, – go ahead. So I don't want to – I want to steal your thunder. No, so, go ahead, my friend. Do it. Please. I have lots of fact, The simple like- fact that these undead legions, uh-huh. they don't have to rest. Yeah. <laughs> That's another advantage. They don't have to rest. Weight is really not an issue. They don't get tired. They're not fatigued. This they- is the army that does not move on its stomach. That's right. 
But now, see, and this that, and that's a prime example. Now, that's just if you're dealing with skeletons, no problem. But now, when you're dealing with ghouls and gas and other types of creatures, sometimes zombies, not so much zombies, but ghouls and gas, not only because they're intelligent, but they have this ravenous hunger that always, you know, gnaws at them. So when they go longer without food, they get more crazy and frenzied. So that makes them even worse. And and honestly, I don't, I'm I'm shocked that they don't use gas and in, uh, in the front line at the very beginning to break that middle, the first line of of, of our defense. Are you, you know? are you thinking like the gas and ghouls being used kind of like berserkers in a way? Oh no, not at all. Because the gas have that stench ability. <laughs> because no, they, that's true. They disrupt the the normal flow of the ranks because people are failing their saving throws because of the stench. Then you got the ghouls and gas that can paralyze, and it's just amazing what can be done if you use the right amount of creatures in the right ranks and use them at the proper time. They can cause so much damage. I'm just trying to think of like using like a whole bunch of ghouls and gas as like shock troops. Like, let's just not feed them for a month. Then we'll bring them onto the field of the battle. Let's see what happens. Yeah, definitely. Starve them. Starve them to the and point And then you of- let them out on the field of the battle against your the living. Yes. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and watch the fun. How about they using, like, a Type 3 demon or something to run the army? Can't see yeah. why not. I yeah. would have a problem with that if it was Orcus-related, because Orcus is the uh, Prince of Undead, and I think that would be extremely, you know, likely that he would send a demon in his stead to, to control an army of undead creatures. Yeah, I'm looking at the book. I'm thinking of ideas to expand on them, and right. demon popped up on my mind for that. Yeah. Type 3, like, demon. Or or a devil. Mm, devil might be a little too high. Uh, well, I mean, I don't think devils would really be involved with the dead too much. I know that demons will, especially Orcus. I mean, you can't mess around with Orcus. When it comes to him and undead creatures, it's awesome. But there, there could be some of the lower lower devils, um, not the arch devils, but the, the lower ones, you know, That's the... Uh, the princes or all yeah. those kinds there. But, you know, when I looked at the, now, you know, the, the other section that they covered here was the Undead Legion tactical setups. No way would I use this. This is definitely not the way to do it. <laughs> this is definitely not the way to do it here. I would do things a little different. You don't like the triangle format they have? No, I, I really don't. I don't. And like I said, it, it all depends on who's attacking and who is defending. I but I did. Tactic in, uh, you ever heard of the game Total War, Rome? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, wow, that's yeah, I've used this triangle tactic in that game, and it works out pretty well. Okay. I hear the police. Yeah. But it's, it's so good. <laughs> they hear we're talking about an undead army and everything. So, yeah, so I looked at these things. I would do things a little different. And just for, you know, time, time's sake and clarity, I'm not going to explain how I feel it should be done if, if I was to do this. But I will tell you that if you use the, uh, the battle system rules... For second edition, are, are y'all familiar with those? Who I had the battle system for first edition. I had oh, I'm had sorry, them. not second. I mean first. That's what I meant. First edition. Oh yeah. The, okay. Yes, use the battle system if you want to run a, a a battle of this this kind. Those rules are very clear in how to do it. If you don't like them, then use the rules out of Dragonlance, which has some more clarity. Hmm. And then that's to assign, you know, which units, their defense and attack value and all the other little nuances and everything. And you can have an interesting uh, a game session for that day if you decide to use it. However, I will notice one thing here when they show that last picture there about the enemy line and how the, the flank or the rear attack, the strategies for breaking undead wedge attack and all that, how they did that. Mm-hmm. That's real similar to what they did in Troy, that they went around the side and came from behind and then attacked the people. Right, yeah, that way you're engaged in melee combat with the archers as opposed to the first rank. Right. That's why it's got to be real careful on how they set this up and everything. I was just, uh, I was a little disappointed. This is archaic. This is an old book. How old is this, Vince? Uh, like 80, 86. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, I guess there could have been some 86. changes in yeah. Well, whoever designed these these attack formations definitely didn't have a military mindset. I can see it working in some. Well, it, it all depends on you know who they're fighting, what 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 army is being equipped with what and everything. This could be successful against certain types of armies. Yeah, it doesn't say. It doesn't say who wrote it. Usually, they do. No, 
it's all good. It's all good. Like I said, this is an interesting article and everything. This discusses how to make an, a, a, a yeah. legion, a, a, you know, a legion of undead to use an army, how it's broken up, how it's designed and everything. And from there on, it, it, it's all on your own. Then. Hopefully a party will never have to run to this kind of problem. Yep. Mm, okay. Found the authors, uh, Laurel Nicholson and John Keefe. Cool. Yeah. See, I don't know who they are. I don't know where they came up, but it's all good. I, they might have borrowed it from another book or something. But what you could do with this is and apply it into like a regular army too. Just use the tactics here. First oh, rank yeah. could be like your guys with clubs. Second rank could be uh, your archer rank of archers. Your third rank could be your, like your knights. You just do it that way. You can apply it to a regular army very easily. It's very interesting and everything. And they don't cover examples such as if uh, – well, we won't talk about this. I won't discuss about the creature feature, but like, for example, depends on who they're fighting. What if he was fighting an army of crusaders and they were all uh, first-level fighters but third-level clerics? You see what I'm saying? They were multi-class or dual-class you know, individuals. These undead would have some serious problems then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I but I think you also have to take into account that the setting that these armies exist in as well. It, the right. Post the apocalyptic, in a way, uh, undead world, it actually kind of reminds me of the one Ravenloft uh, realm. Uh, what? Who was that? Uh, the Grim Harvest box set, where basically right. everything died and became undead. That's huh. basically this world. Yeah. Yeah. This also reminds me of the battle between Falconia, uh, Falconia, whatever the hell it is, and the other one. What was the name of it? He was always fighting them, but he would constantly lose the battle, and his his army would be converted into undead for the other side. I forgot who kept attacking. I think it was Azalin. Azalin's yeah. lands, he kept attacking. I can't remember which is which. But, uh, yeah, it's the same thing. The same thing happens between Vecna and what's the name of that vampire? Koss? Uh, the one that cut his hand off and all that stuff? Yes. Yeah, yeah Koss. Yeah, because both of them are always fighting. The same thing happens. Undead versus undead. I mean, if a if specter hits another specter, nothing really happens, you know? So <laughs> it's kind of weird how they fight with their undead legions. It's pretty impressive. But no, this is a, a very good chapter on, on how to set it up, the, you know, how, how, how to develop it. Put some ideas out there. Cool. Awesome. I like it. Yep. If you have any tactics, write us or staff at gmail.com. And we'll head into game mechanics. You think I'm mad? Perhaps I am. What are you, a wizard, a genius? Darn. A perfectly good brain wasted. Game mechanics. All right, everybody. Uh, game mechanics. Is, we'll just uh, continue on with our theme of the uh, Undead book by Roll Aids from, I think, 1986. Yes. And one uh, section of this... Not everything is bad in this little world that they made, like the post-apocalyptic undead world that uh, that Matt uh, did say in the last segment. There are some um, freedom fighters, if you will, and they are dwarves. And there's one page about them, and they're called the Dwarven, I guess, I think the B is silent, the Dwarven Zantras. And who they are, they are... Um, in the dwarven t- tongue, Zantras, they are freedom fighters. They are trying to fight and reclaim their lands that they've lost under these undead legions. There's approximately 200 or so of these dwarven fighters. And they've held up in this area where it's um, – they live in lava tubes that they've um, converted uh, into homes for themselves – and they are constantly setting up traps in these lava tubes, uh, basically uh, traps where any undead might get uh, thrown into uh, uh, some uh, pools of holy water. So that's a good way of keeping your undead out of your home. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, the lava tubes, I guess, are very difficult to or nearly impossible to define. Uh, so they have a very good hiding place because everything blends into this landscape of lava tubes, the tunnels of pumice and obsidian. So that's where they live. Uh, now these these uh, Zantras, these dwarven freedom fighters, they basically just use hit and run guerrilla tactics against uh, against the legions of the undead, and they use these creatures called rompos as um, as mounts. And they ride through the land of Verdes, 
the land is called Verdes. They try to fight uh, the ultimate goal of these guys is to send Night Bay and the Lich Lords back to the grave permanently. Uh, one thing I found that was interesting is in the next paragraph where they say that the in battle that the Zantras are a real sight to behold because they use they're completely naked and they're covered head to toe with wax from candles and various war paints. People who have seen them say they almost look like the undead legions that they fight. And it's, I guess, it's especially true when the moonlight reflects off the wax. So they look very, very bizarre. They look like, I guess the best way to describe them is like berserker dwarves covered with war paint and completely, <laughs> and completely knocked. <laughs> completely knocked dwarves running around. So... Uh, but food and supplies, how they survive, probably through some of a lot of their hit and run tactics or some adventurers who carry supplies in for them. Uh, sometimes they uh, attack the supply house of Ashland Inn, but uh, they also uh, they find that very uh, come increasingly difficult due to the hiring of armed guards to protect the food. Uh, the Zantras drink the water squeezed from the black cactus, which is boiled, or they collect uh, water from the condensation that accumulates on various plants on the ground. So these are these Zantras, these dwarven legions. I thought it was really interesting. I was reading through this. For some reason, I was thinking, man, this sounds a lot like Dark Sun before Dark Sun ever happened. Yeah. I was you know, also it, it kind of got that dark sun vibe to me. Yeah, I was also thinking they kind of remind me like uh, of a more intelligent gully dwarf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they, they the, like the gully dwarves, they live in these dark uh, recesses of Earth, and uh, they're basically trying to get free from a more powerful uh, foe that's enslaving them or attempting to. Mm-hmm. So, and uh, they, and but then also part of me is like. The whole uh, the sneak attack, the sneak tactics that they use really isn't your typical uh, stereotypical dwarven tactic. That's more something like I would think of like an elf. Right. Yeah. It's and like I think it's because there are just so few of them. Yeah. It's they very much. It's like a mix of like the gully dwarf with like a elvish raiding party. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, but yeah, it's they're definitely very interesting in. Just a completely different take on your uh, typical dwarfs. You don't hear about them. Well, we're doing our mining and we're we're going to take battle head on. No, they realize that would be suicidal in yeah. the world they they exist in. So they have to stick, move, and hit and act and use a different tactics that in most dwarven cultures wouldn't be accepted. The picture of them on on here, I guess that's the picture what they look like. Does not look like a typical dwarf. No, no, it does it, not. it's very. It's more like a <laughs> elvish. It, it, I. It's more I, human. I don't no know. beard. Yeah, one arm too. Yeah. No, I, 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 I think there's, there's a reason why they show the picture from the side because if they do, you're looking at his birthday suit. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, he's completely naked with all these different tattoos on him. Yeah, yeah, the the yeah. Stuff, so. swinging a little tiny hand axe as opposed to the big giant. Uh, well, he only has one hand, Matt. So how is he going to do two axes? <laughs> <laughs> they're, only, they're only born with one arm. I don't know where's the second arm. Behind him, on the other side, that you can't see. Oh well, they did a horrible job of doing it. Then there you go. Okay, well, either way, he had to do it from the side because if he was facing totally his back to us, then that picture would have been deemed. Uh, Right Not appropriate. <laughs> yeah, it would have been inappropriate. And if he did it the other way, we know it definitely wouldn't have been appropriate. It would have been an X-rated magazine. I th- put- yeah, I just thought that these dwarves, the, as they're described in here, was a little ahead of its time. Because I don't think you really saw anything like that, like I said, in, until you got to the Dark Sun, Sun supplement years later. It just, it's just, I think it's a good example of what will happen like a society like dwarves, like Matt was saying. And they just get totally devastated. What would happen? What would they do? Well, they would pretty much reinvent themselves from what it looks like, at least from from from, from what they've uh, depicted here. New recruits are always welcome. Hmm. 
<laughs> We're always looking for a few good men. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's almost like super uh, uh, Starship Troopers, you know. Yes. Join now. Would you like to know more? Would you like to know more? Become so, a citizen. <laughs> yes, become a become a Zantra's uh, dwarven warrior. Would you like to know more? <laughs> so, <laughs> anywho, uh, tell us what you guys think of the Zant. If anybody else has anything to say on it, I don't know if there's anybody else. What do you guys think? Anything else? I, I thought it was that? a really cool race. But I, I, it'd be a really cool race to bring into a game just to see see how somebody plays it. Yeah, yeah. I I just see them like little berserker types. You know, I would play them as very non-intelligent people, but very good with tactics and sneaking up and hiding and mm. maybe street wisdom wise, really smart, but intelligent wise, not. Yeah. OK, Kinda like caveman with a group or something. Yeah, in a way. Yeah. Caveman right. with some Napoleonic tactics. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> yeah, tell us what you think. Or if I stay yep. at email dot com. Or you can call us on the hotline, 570-865-4210. Oh, my God. Nick got it two weeks in a row. Yeah, I know. I'm looking at the right website. Down, uh, I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> Let us what you know, these guys. Uh, yes, the uh, Dwarven Berserker Warriors are standing by. Oh, so. boy. <laughs> All right. Let's go on to our next segment. Captain King. Hey, man. <laughs> And then as we continue upon our undead vein, we go to the dragon's horde, which of course means it's a weapon that would be affecting the undead. Because when you have thousands and thousands of zombies, you need some sort of weapon to do combat specifically with them. Uh, and we will be talking about the holy sword of Griswold. I keep wanting to say Griswold, at which point I don't think they had it when they went to visit Wally World. <laughs> Didn't he have it when he used to get on the roller coaster? That might be how they punctured the front gate and did battle with the moose. Oh, my God. I hated that show. <laughs> well, he, he captured John Candy with this thing. Oh, that what was, was a- his name? That was Chevy Chase. Ugh. Yeah. Horrible actor. I keep saying Griswold, too. So. Yes, I know. I kept thinking. Gris- it's not Griswold. It's Griswold. And- yeah. Wold. Griswold. Uh, and it's the Holy Sword of Griswold. And what it does, it's a magical short sword, as opposed to typically you see these giant long swords. But considering it's probably go- it's going to be used by dwarves, it kind of makes sense. Uh, it gives plus four against all undead, and the wielder gets plus four to save against fear upon the side of the undead. Which, when you have thousands and the thousands of skeletons coming your way, that's probably a good thing to have. Yeah, that's pretty important. <laughs> yeah, but it, this is where it also gets a little interesting in its next trait. The blade can shoot holy water for an additional two uh, hits to kill of damage f- to an undead. So it also squirts holy water. <laughs> awesome. Yes, that can only be used twice a day. Uh, Well, it says can be used twice per day. Yeah, that's what confused me. They mean the sword itself? Or? Well, considering the compartment that holds the holy water has enough for four, that twice per day means you can only unsheath the sword twice a day? Yeah, I, that's what I didn't understand. Yeah. I or, think they meant that the, the holy water squirt. <laughs> but why would it have four uses? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it only works twice, but you can shoot twice that. Uh, yeah, so that's something Before I would probably... Uh, I don't know. I think what it is, what it comes down to, you can use one or one or the other. You either can use it to shoot holy water, which can be used twice per day, since it's not able to, you know, control how much you use. Or if you want to pour it out, then you have four uses in case you have four empty vials on you. Okay, I could go with that because it makes that makes far more sense than you can only use this sword twice a day. What does it? <laughs> it does not come out of its sheath. Sorry, I'm Union. I've already been used twice. I'm yeah. done for the day. Call it <laughs> Yeah, but uh, it's a your short sword made of steel that's been treated with silver. It has ancient dwarven runes carved into it, so the dwarves did have something to do with its construction. And it's got a nice little star sapphire set into the end of the tang. And this it, it makes the Holy Avenger look like crap. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. 
I don't know. I, I think well, this is better. Well, first off, the, well, in the hands of a paladin, the Holy Avenger wins. Yeah, oh, it rocks. Right. Yeah. Uh, Holy Avenger, if you're not a paladin, you only get the plus two. But a Holy Avenger in the hands of a paladin, it wins hands down. Because uh, I'd have said a rust monster after you, then we'll take care of that mess. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, Holy Avenger is a plus five in the hands of a paladin. You get 50% magic resistance. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Right. Part. And it dispels magic in a five foot radius at the level of magic use equal to the experience of the paladin. So, you're, oh, yeah, I'm definitely, yeah. Yeah. And then it inflicts an extra 10 hit points of bonus da- damage upon chaotic evil. This is like the uh, Holy Avengers' little brother. Yeah, it's like its cousin, maybe a nephew. But it's Red definitely headed. use it. The Holy Sword of Griswold has <laughs> <laughs> has more utility. Sorry, Mister Griswold. Griswold. <laughs> Griswold. Yes, Mister Griswold. Sorry, it's, uh, sorry, it's closed. <laughs> I think the only thing I liked about those stupid movies is when the cat got electrocuted underneath the chair. Oh, 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 that was yeah, it's called Christmas, Christmas, Christmas vacation. vacation. Yes, she wrapped her cat. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back on topic. But I think the sword. I think the sword. This sword here, that holy sword of G, is okay. I mean, uh, let me tell you what I don't like about one. It provides the wielder with plus four to all saves versus fear upon sight of undead. I can't think of any undead that affect you like that in first edition AD and D. Yeah, um, um, there is one. There is. Um, Just look at that one. Makes yeah. you run away. I don't think there is. But I think it's, in roll aids, it's different. So yeah, I, that, I, that's probably what they're applying. So if, yeah, yeah. That's so probably, in in a roll aids world, that pr- does make a difference. Um, but the it's only plus four against undead. Against non undead, yeah. it's a sword that yep, can spray some much. water. It, yep, it's a it's a clown favor against non undead. <laughs> <laughs> it will. Yeah. What year did the Ravenloft module come out? Nineteen eighty five. Uh, yeah, eighty five, eighty six, somewhere in that area. What are the rules in the Ravenloft when they saw a certain undead? They had to make a sp- uh, check versus fear at certain points. Well, not in the first module, but I, I don't know if that has to do with, with if, if that was a plane issue or the demi plane issue or if it was just because of undead. I, don't, I just can't recall at the time being right now. I remember reading somewhere about when you first encounter undead, it was supposed to be a save versus fear. Somewhere I remember seeing that. Yeah, there might be somewhere. I just can't recall right now. But if I look in the monster manual, I just don't see any monsters in the monster manual that yeah. says that if you look at this undead, that you have to make a fear check versus yeah. it. Yeah, Ravenloft I mean, was 83. Oh, wait a minute. You know what? I think the mummy might be the one that I'm thinking about that, that does have some issues. Yeah. So one of them has fear. I know I've seen it. I bet you it's the mummy. But it's just one... a thought. It, it, it's just a funny attack. But this sword is definitely... Oh, you know, it's the, the mummy. It, if you get within 60 feet, it'll cause fear and revulsion. I knew there, it. There it goes. See, I knew there was one monster. I, I knew there was one. I, I, I corrected myself quickly before anyone else did. <laughs> But I believe that's the only one. How about the ghast? I don't know. The ghast stinks. He just stinks. He stinks. He does stink. Maybe he needs to take no. a shower. Is what you're trying to say? No, no, he doesn't do that either. He doesn't do that stuff. It's just that they get that stench. That carrion stench. Specters that don't have that. And neither do ghosts. Ghosts should have a fear on. I think liches ghosts- even don't have that. Yeah, so I, it's strange how the mummy has that ability, and the others do not. It's just a thought. It's just that, you know, when you're talking about the sword, I was just looking at when you're talking about how powerful it is and how, how non-powerful it is, and uh, Matt made a good point on that. So that's to say, plus four to all saves versus fear upon sight of undead. So you might be right. Maybe this is something that is, uh, uh, you know, crucial for roll aids. Maybe yeah, it might be in that game world, yeah. Maybe it was in Dragon Magazine they made up a rule for undead like that. Yeah, but I'll have to take a look. When was this book made? In 19 what? 86. 86. Oh, okay. That's why I was thinking it was the, the Ravenloft module that had that. That's a good possibility. I'll have to take a look at that. Yeah. Anyway, so this sword I thought would be kind of cool to bring up because of the undead legions, but also maybe it could be a good sword to stick into your campaign for maybe your dwarven paladin to find. Until he finds his holy avenger. Right. Yeah. This what? Is... Dwarven paladins. Yes. Yeah. Why not? Why not? What? <laughs> First edition? Why not? Ah! 
<laughs> at least it's not a kinder paladin. Oh my goodness. The show's coming to an end. Why can't a dwarf be a paladin? Because it well, says in the book they can't. Uh, oh, what, what, if, what, if, what if, why not? What if your player's like, well, I want to play something different? Well, they can play. <laughs> well, they can, play, they can play D20. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, see, what I was looking for, there is a plus four. There is a sword plus four versus undead in uh, the DMG. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just taking a look at the differences between the prices of these. And that sword's only worth 4,500 gold pieces. But this sword here, this holy sword of Griswold, mm-hmm. is, its value is 20,000 gold. Well, because of the abilities, I guess it has on it. The holy water squirter. Yeah. And the whoosh. So, water. Um, <laughs> and the I just checked the Holy Avenger is only twenty thousand gold, so it has equal value as the Sword of Griswold. Yeah, you know no. what? I, <laughs> I would just I, the I, would, I just thought I'm sorry. <laughs> Instead of having holy water in it, put ketchup in it. <laughs> it, and actually, it shoots there, ketchup. And actually, there's nothing Real saying. Ketchup, yeah, there's nothing saying you have to put holy water in it too. You could put something else in it, like ketchup. Exactly, taco sauce. <laughs> yeah. Uh-oh, I don't know oh, where oh, this conversation I, could, is No, I want to debate this with you two over here saying the dwarves can't be paladins. So let's just reel it in here for a minute. Why can the dwarf not be a paladin? Just because the book says it doesn't, but why can't it? Maybe in your if, campaign, if, maybe they, they can, but mine, fighter. they can't. They could be a fighter. They could be a cleric. Why can't they be a holy crusader paladin? Because well, it's not if, rules. <laughs> if they could be a paladin, then they could be made magic users as well. Fine. Okay, well, why wouldn't there be just that one chance of one of those people being that in the society? No, well, I agree with you. I, I, I have, you know, I shouldn't say these things. I better keep them uh, in <laughs> no, what it comes down to is like I disagree with people saying that kobolds can't have classes in their system or orcs or or goblins and lizard men. Well, Why they... can't there be fighters and shamans and that stuff within their race? I've seen shamans plenty of times. Yeah, I'm saying I let them. There's no reason why not. Yeah. Nick is the one hard up on saying no, so. No, I just go by what the rules say, that's all. First time in the world you run by the rules. Every time you don't. But... Hey, I'm just saying as far as the classes. I, hey, hey. We got you now. Fine, have your little dwarven paladin. He yeah. gets his holy adventure sword. That's actually a, a you know, I don't know, a two handed sword they can't use. Have fun. Well, that's why well, you know what Nick. It's going to question when we, play for, yeah, when we play a first edition game. That's what I'm giving you a dwarven paladin. I don't want to play a Dwarven Paladin. Well, his name would be Nick. I want to play a first-level fighter human named Bob. (laughs) Oh, boy. Anyway, (laughs) we went way off topic here. Sorry, folks. Let's head into our next segment. (laughs) Creature, 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 creature. Feature, feature, theater this week. We have a wonderful mon. Anyway, we have this <laughs> monster that's still in the book, but it's called a fear spider. Nasty little creature. It's not bigger than, what is it, a disc? The North Space ones. Yeah, a discus. Little orange spider. What, the it's size like, of a frisbee? Yeah, pretty much the size of a frisbee. And they're little biatches, I've got to tell you. They have these little sacks on their web that explode if you try to go through them, and they cause two to eight points of damage by each little sack for everybody in a 10-foot radius. So if you're breaking through their web and these little things explode, I imagine there's four of them on there. That's how much damage you're going to be taking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Four times the 2d8 damage. Eight sacks full of acid. Yeah. Lovely. Yep. Yeah, and then the little spiders themselves have little acid sacks on them, too. So if you try to attack them and kill them, they explode, and that's another 1d6 points of damage. Ugh. Yep. But the, what I was talking about the, uh, the fear before, the fear spiders have the similar thing as a gas that it paralyzes anybody that fails to save versus paralyzation because of the odor that they have. They have that putrid odor like the gas has. So basically you smell that, you make your save, you fail... The spider comes over to you, crawls up on you, starts making a web around you, and then tries to bite your head. <laughs> nice. For damage, killing you, and then wrapping you up for food later on. 
So the uh, the acid sacks are probably the most powerful yeah. thing about them. Yeah, and then if you try to think, oh, instead of hacking through the web, we'll burn through it, they still explode. This yeah. time it sends it into a 15-foot radius, causing one to six hit points to all creatures in the vicinity. Mm-hmm. And the webbing is stronger than normal webbing, so if you try to brush it off your friends and hit the spider on his shoulder, it ain't going to happen. No. Nah. Yeah. So these are little nasty little creatures that you can throw into your game anywhere. Uh, I would they, send a hundred of them against that dwarven paladin. Well, they, <laughs> they live, Nick. They live in colonies, pretty much. So, uh, let's see here. They don't say how many a colony exactly would be, but well, the colony is probably pretty big with the spiders. But you know what this reminds me of? Their vents. What's that? You ever saw the movie The Mist? Yes. Those spiders in there. When they went to the uh, the drugstore to get the drugs, and those spiders yeah. were in there, and they cast those webs that were acidy. Yes, yes. This is what, what it reminds me. That's when the, when that the, the old lady used the uh, can of hairspray to make a, uh, a flamethrower and burn one down. That's what it reminds me of. Ugh. Oh. I hate you never spiders. Saw the mist? Uh, yeah, I, yeah saw the- I know. I remember that now. I hate spiders. <laughs> I hate that movie's ending. Eight-legged freaks should be killed. Typical Stephen King ending to the movie. Hey, but yeah, you know, I know. Feel good movie of the year that one was. But yeah. I will tell you though, I like that ending better than the alternate ending. And what the was- alternate, the alternate ending was when uh, they was in the car, and they what they did was they was Spoiler posting. Spoiler alert, some, everybody! Ah, it's okay. It's on YouTube. They was posting some biblical verses, I believe, and whatever. And uh, it was it was doing the uh, the. Not the zoom, the unzoom ability, going out into space, and you see that the uh, the fog. Well, first the fog was going over the the county, then it was going over the state, then it was going over the country, and eventually up to, to a scene from uh, from the moon. You can see that the entire planet was in, encapsulated by the mist. Yeah. So, but in seeing the movie, it made it sound like that the mist disappeared after like two three days. Yeah, it just suddenly just went away, according to That's the right, yeah. But the alternate ending didn't reveal that. It just revealed that the whole planet was encapsulated by the mist. So I have no problem with that that ending. <laughs> but those spiders messed up that one dude, because remember, they was inside of him, and he fell down, and his body broke open, and thousands of those spiders came out of him? Mm-hmm. I could not stand it. That's what this reminds me of. Yeah. That was a good movie in the sense that it was a good, like, adventure-type movie to steal ideas from. Oh, yeah. I, that was, like, one of the most... And my, yeah, it was very Lovecraftian too. I mean, I mm-hmm. thought, Excellent. wow, yes, totally Lovecraftian in nature. I, I thought that was just a, a phenomenal movie where you could use that in a Call of Cthulhu kind of environment. Well, that's the kind of monsters you would encounter anyway. And there's always a fear check in Call of Cthulhu, isn't there? Uh, not fear, but sanity. No, sanity. Sanity. Okay, I never actually played it, so. Nobody ever wants to play, and it's on my shelf, dusting away. Play oh, what? Goodness. All Cthulhu. No, why don't you join us in our game on Thursday? I can't. I'm just doing something else. Uh, well. So, uh, so these spiders are orange? I wonder why they're orange. Well, they don't really say why they're orange. It's well, just a, the, the habitat is desert. Because they citric acid. Ah. Oh, that makes sense right there. If it's a rocky desert, I guess they would be oranges in color or reddish or whatever. Right. Yeah. Right. So they are orange to blend in with the terrain. That makes sense. Yeah, the rocky desert. So maybe, yeah. Uh, like the ants are out there, too. So. But maybe they, the they're not by themselves, themselves so. as oranges. Oh, bite into this. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have any. I notice they don't have any treasure in the lair unless a victim carries something very valuable. Oh, wow, look at that. They have a strong, putrid smell similar to that of a gas. Yeah, like I was saying before. But see, yeah. their their smell paralyzes anyone. Right. Yeah. Wow. Well, doesn't a gas smell paralyze too? No, only the touch. The smell just sickens you and it, yeah. Uh, yeah, it makes you have minuses to attack. Yeah, and all that yeah the smell. It's almost like, like troglodytes. Yeah. Yeah, oh. exactly. Wow. Those yeah. are some nasty spiders. There's the smell will paralyze you. I guess they're called fear spiders because you, if you see them, you're in trouble. So you better fear them. Yeah, yeah I can understand yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, I definitely would run away yeah. from these bad boys. Yeah, this, 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 good this, idea about a monster who I call a dream spider, but I can't tell you on the air because I'm going to use it. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I guess that's going to wrap up the show. Oh. 
Oh. It's too bad. I was having so much fun. <laughs> what else you want to talk about? We have plenty of time. I'm not going anywhere. Let's talk about some dwarven paladins. <laughs> right. no, I'm just joking. No, I'm That's just it. Around. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I know Thorky's going to be running a game on Skype on Saturday nights, uh, the community game. He's running his G modules. Yeah. So we're going to be having cool. fun playing that. Cool. I told him I wish him luck and everything. If he, if, he, if you see any three-headed dogs smoking a cigar, run. <laughs> <laughs> I know my campaign uh, that I'm starting up with uh, my daughter Anna and her friends, that'll be starting up next few weeks. So... Uh, Hopefully, I'll be posting on the uh, OSR Gaming website, and uh, yeah, I'll put the, I'll do a blog on it there. Yeah. So, oh, cool. I'm looking. I'm really, really looking forward to this. In fact, uh, the one kid up the street, uh, John, I gave him his own copy of the Player's Handbook, and he was just last night. It was his birthday recently, and I, I go here, John. This is for you. He's like. <gasps> Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! He was, all, he was like all excited. I'm like, yay! <laughs> Another geek is brought into the fold. I Aww. felt so good. Yeah, it was great. It's a, and his his old man's excited about it too because he's gonna be playing as well. So, yeah, we got. I think we're gonna have about six people. So I think that'd be perfect. Yeah. That's yeah, that's good. Yep. Yeah. Uh, in my uh, weekly gaming group, we're going to be starting up a first edition Ravenloft game soon. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that'll be interesting because it's been a while since any of them have played first edition, but they have in the past. So, I want to play. I want to play a vampire. Yeah, uh, name, uh, count, uh, name uh, Count Blickenhaus. Blah. Blah. <laughs> you should be Count Duckula. I will be Count Blickenhaus. I will drink you like a high sea fruit drink box. <laughs> Oh, and my lord, you sound, sound like that dude that counts on Sesame Street. What's his name? The, the Count? The count. <laughs> oh, is that what his name was? Yeah. I that's what it was. Yeah. And I know on, on Monday nights, Will, you're going to be in DM Dwayne's game. Uh, yes, uh, Monday I'll be playing that. Uh, it'll be the Rules Cyclopedia. I guess that, I don't know if it's going it's to be basic, I guess. So. Yeah, uh, yeah. Basic Rules Encyclopedia, yeah. He's yeah. out all the crap from Rules Encyclopedia. Pretty much he's using Mentor Rules Encyclopedia. Which okay. doesn't make sense to me. Why don't you just use Mentor, but whatever. Yeah, I don't know. I guess because they have all the conglomeration of everything all in one book at one place, so you don't need, like, two, three books. Well, I don't know. I'm playing a cleric. Sweet. Does he use blunt weapons or sharp weapons? <laughs> oh, this, my gosh, people. This dude, <laughs> my cleric will be using blunt weapons and killing pigs with pig... I mean, orcs with pig heads. There you go. Pig faces. I was going to say pigs with orc faces, but that's not what I meant. <laughs> pigs with orc faces. <laughs> Do that. Uh, and on Tuesday nights, I'm going to be bringing back my Book of Sorrows campaign. I got back the whole Yay. group. Yay. Everyone, get the band back together. <laughs> everybody minus Crispy, so he's too was busy. Clang, what, was that Clang dude playing? Clang, oh, Clangador? Yeah. No, he's not playing. He wasn't part of the original group. Oh, Nothing. Thought... He just wasn't part of the original group. And, uh, oh, yeah, I wanted to tell you, Will, that Save or Die got a new banner for their webpage. Jim, right. what's his name? Jim Wampler did the art for it, and he actually did an orc on there with a pig face. Right. And he actually said to, to in the little thing, he's like, and they have an orc with pig face on to tell Will about that. He's going to be all jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Where is this at again? I got to see this. Save or Die. Dot, save or Die. Dot info, the website. There's their banner on the top. He did the uh. art. And there's an orc with a pig face on there, and he did it purposely just to uh, little dig at you, Will. <laughs> what did I do wrong? He was just joking around. <laughs> joking around. Oh, now it's Save or Die. Now, where's it at again? Right there on the top of the page, Save or Die. Info. Our sister oh. podcast. Well, the picture's not coming up. All I see is a green banner on top. Oh, there it goes. I, I just see I see if there where there's a wizard and a guy fighting an orc, but I don't see no conversation. There's no 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 conversation. It just said it was an orc with a pig face. Oh okay okay. Oh I thought they were saying something. Okay. okay. That was an email he gave to us. So <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> I was just I was just laughing at the guy's email when he said that do your orcs have pig faces? I was just laughing at that. Yeah, so he, he just put a little knock on us. <laughs> oh Jim Wampler, he's on Facebook, I believe. Yeah, he's, he's just the um, oh, who's that 
the mage marvin the mage he does the marvin the mage uh comic he also does uh drawings for uh tim Cass's a bi-weekly od and d game at uh yada quest in cincinnati oh cincinnati. well that's funny that he did that because of me because i was laughing at it yeah so something to give us to be jealous by so <laughs> we need a that's new awesome. web page so if you want to draw us a banner will draw us one okay yeah, That's we should have it. one with a with a dwarven paladin and a cleric carrying like a sword. <laughs> It'd be a stick figure. <laughs> Maybe dwarven paladins can only use blunt weapons. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Since well, I, they can't use the sword of Clark W. Griswold. <laughs> yes. Awesome. I oh. went I that went, shoots ketchup. <laughs> by accident I went to rfrpodcast.com and you know what comes up? RottingFleshRadio.com. Oh, wow. <laughs> Ooh, that sounds fun. Oh, oh God, goodness. we just plugged them. <laughs> yeah, plugged Rotting Flesh Radio for you. That sounds fun. Check it out, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's enough that's of that. Let's get out of here. Yeah. All right. Original keep it all cool. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Roll for initiative.